All right, y'all, my name is Phil Pustiowski, and I want to thank you for being here. Because um, I know you have a lot of other choices of where you could be when I was in school. Um, I know I had a lot of choices, and it was a constant battle. Do I go to class or not? But um, thank you for being here, uh, and I do reward action takers. I believe that 90% of success is just showing up. So because you showed up today, you're all going to get my book. You don't have to go to Amazon. You don't have to go buy it at Barnes & Noble. On your way out the door, you can get a free book. How about that? And uh, also, thank you, Dr. Harris, for giving me this opportunity to, to share this uh, with y'all. Um, my story is, when I first got started, I was just graduating from Vanderbilt University with a degree in mechanical engineering, of all things. And I did an internship as an engineer, and uh, I fell asleep at the desk. And I said, well, this is, this is not going to be my life. No way. Um, and so I started reading books on real estate. And I got so inspired by it. I said, oh, I'm going to go out there and do it. And um, I was a bit premature. I should have probably had a job, maybe an, a, a source of income, because I ended up living out of my truck for a while before I got it all figured out. And uh, you'll read about it in my book, just how I went from living out of my truck to where I am today. I live in central Florida here. I live in uh, New Smyrna Beach. Um, my wife and I, we got to the point economically where we could live anywhere in the world we wanted to. So we, we looked from San Diego, Seattle, New York, where do we want to live? And we chose uh, New Smyrna Beach Beachside. So um, uh, we're kind of living the dream now, and uh, it's a result of real estate. Okay, so uh, show of hands, how many people here, raise your hand if you own real estate. Okay, great. Raise your hand if you would like to own real estate. Okay, great. Raise your hand if you would like to learn how to buy real estate without having to go get a bank loan and without having to put down a down payment. All right, perfect, because that's what I'm talking about today. Good. This is going to be the subject of creative real estate finance, okay? This, this training is, is coming mostly from the School of Hard Knocks. Uh, but also there's publications on these particular subjects. It's just not as much mainstream. This is very creative. It's outside the box, but it can apply to just about everybody. I mean, think about it. Think if you could own a piece of property right now. You didn't have to go to a bank, so you didn't have to worry about your income or your credit. What if you could buy a property right now and maybe you leased out a couple of the rooms to your friends and so you live rent free? Or maybe you were like me in college and the biggest and most important thing was to be able to throw the biggest parties and the landlord would have a problem with it. So if I owned my own property, I wouldn't have that issue. Um, when you have to qualify for a loan, first thing you need to deal with is good credit history. You know, if you're in college, you're, you may not have had the time to build up a good credit history. And even if you had the time to build a good credit history, a lot of people in this country don't have good credit for whatever reason. Another problem with qualifying for a loan is you need high income. They want to see that you're making money. When you go give your application to a banker, they want to see how you're making money. Well, if you're not making a lot of money, it makes it tricky, doesn't it? You also have to have a low debt to income ratio. So, Banks want you to have credit, they want you to borrow money so you have good credit history, but then they have this thing called debt to income. And if you're paying too many debt payments, student loans, credit cards, car loans, versus how much income you're bringing in, they won't give you a loan either. And they usually want a big down payment too. A lot of people don't like all this fun stuff. So what, what you're going to learn here in the next hour or so is how to buy real estate without having to deal with any of this. Is that exciting? By the way, I'm going to uh, be asking checking questions to, uh, to see if y'all are participating. That way nobody falls asleep. All right. So what's in it for you? I talked about you could own your own off-campus house. You know, maybe when you graduate you want to own your own home. This is a way you can do that. And also, since... Um, Y'all have been talking about investments. This is a way where you can start buying investment property. So let me give you the story on my first deal. I had just graduated from Vanderbilt, and I, was, I had read a few books on this thing called real estate. And so I, uh, I drove around this neighborhood near campus, and um, there was a big for sale by owner sign. You've seen those before? So 
I'm all excited. I'm going to put this knowledge to some good work. So I give the, you know, give the sign a call and the person picks up, General Construction Company. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I called off a for sale by owner sign. Um, is this the wrong number? No, you got the right number. I'll be there in a minute. Excuse me? You're at the house, right? Y y yeah, I'll be there. Whoa, guy's kind of pushy, right? So I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't know what, how I was going to buy this property. I had no clue. So he drives up. It's an old guy, like 75 years old. He's just a fast talker. He walks me around the property, and, uh, and he says, well, how are you going to buy this? And I said, well, that's a mighty fine question. He says, well, do you have a loan? I said, oh, there's no way I could qualify for a loan. No, no way. He goes, well, I got some good, I should use his, what, I could use some good, good idea for you, Phil. I'll finance the property. So what do you mean, I'll finance? He was going to offer, since he owned the home with no loan on it, he was going to become the bank. So he would lend me the money. Now, at the time, I thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Now, later I learned that he sold the property to me to, for higher than it was really worth. So it was a good deal for him to, to be the owner finance person. So in other words, what happened was he offered it to me for $150,000, three bedroom, two bath. Now, that, again, that was a little higher than it should have been. But I wasn't going to have to put down a down payment at all. I just would start paying him each month. Does that make sense? So here's how it worked out. No down payment, no bank loan. It was a 6% interest loan that I signed on, but he never checked my credit. He never asked how I was going to make the payment. He didn't even ask for a down payment. Does that make sense? Is that right, interest only? This was interest only. He was being, he was being ultra nice to me. Because I told him, I was like, man, I'm going to have some trouble with this payment if you make it too high. Because I didn't know what I was doing. And so he came back and said, well, I'll make it interest only for you. Interest only it means it's going to be a lower monthly payment because you're not paying any principal. You're just paying the interest. Uh, each, when, you, when you have a mortgage, a part of it goes toward the principal. Part of it goes toward the, the interest. Okay, so the total payment was $1,100. Now, i got to tell you, this was a, a quaint little house just, you know, just south of uh, Vanderbilt's campus in Nashville. And three bedroom, two bath like that would at the most rent for $1,000 a month. But here this thing um, is, I'm going to have to pay $1,100. So here's what I did. I rented each of the three bedrooms for $500 apiece. And I brought in $1,500. The best part is the parents co-signed. You know, here I am, I'm 22 years old, no clue what I'm doing. And one of these tenants was late on his rent. I got a parent to call me and apologize. I am so sorry the payment's not due at the, you know, when, when it was due. I'm overnighting you, your rent. I couldn't believe it. I shouldn't even own this place. Never mind, I got a parent you know, bowing down to me as the landlord. So I brought in 400 bucks a month each month. Raise your hand if you want 400 bucks a month coming in extra. Not all of you, that's okay. That's fine. I understand, y'all got bigger sites. You're gonna be billionaires. So I was bringing in $400 a month positive cash flow. How come I was able to positive cash flow on this property when normally it rents for a thousand? What did I do? I leased it out to, to students, didn't I? Student, student rentals is some of the smartest rentals you'll ever do. Because the parents are gonna co-sign and the students are going to be back next year and next year. The college ain't going nowhere. Whereas if you, if you had a lot of rental property next to a big plant or factory, that could go out of business, right? Y'all may know more than I do, but I think the, the state of Florida hadn't gone out of business yet, and UCF's doing just fine. So student rentals is not only uh, consistent, not only is it good to have the parents co-sign, but also you can rent by the room. So hopefully... By the end of this, you'll be inspired. You may say, you know what? Maybe I should own my own rental. Maybe I should start to lease out some of the, you know, the other rooms, and then I can live for free. But there are three creative ways to buy real estate. I just talked about the first one, which is owner financing. And by the way, at the end of this, you can ask me any questions um, you have. Uh, because if I run too fast through some of this and you didn't quite get everything, just, just make some notes, and then we'll, we'll touch on it in the end. So owner financing works when the owner owns the property outright. 
What kind of property owners own properties outright with no loans on them? That's right. He just said old people. That's right. Older people, retirees, they, they have been paying on that mortgage for 30 years. They've paid it off. That also means properties that are inherited by old people, right? So that's another example. And so when people own properties outright, you have the ability to potentially negotiate an owner finance deal. So that's one way in which you can buy a real estate without a loan. Pretty cool, huh? The next way is through a, a subject two. Subject two means subject to the existing financing, meaning there's already a loan on the property and you're literally just going to take over that loan. And I'll go into that in just a minute, a little more detail. And the third way, a uh, major way to do this is through a lease option, which is kind of quasi. I mean, a lease option, you don't own it. You control it because you rent it with the option to buy it. Uh, but we'll talk about each one of those as well in, in detail. All right, so real estate 101. Y'all may already know all this, but uh, it sets up nicely for the next slide, okay? Um, to own a home, what really signifies ownership is a deed, D-E-E-D. -E -E -D. And what happens is the, the previous owner signs over the deed to you. They sign a document and it gets recorded. Where does it get recorded, what, by the way? Does anybody know? Yeah, the county recorder's office, the courthouse, yes. So the, each county in America has a recorder's office, and that's where these deeds get recorded. Now, the mortgage company wants to protect their interest, right? Because they just shelled out 150 grand or however much it was. A separate document is going to get recorded as well. Now, I'm calling it a mortgage. Uh, in the state of Florida, it's called a deed of trust, but it could also be called a, a mortgage in other states. And so that's a separate document. Does that make sense? So the owner is one document. The money is another document. You know, when I speak in front of big crowds, I'll do the whole spiel of uh, if anybody's cell phone goes off, they'll give uh, $20 to their favorite charity. We won't do that here today, though. Okay, so the anatomy of an owner finance deal is you become the owner, right? So uh, this, uh, this uh, seller of my uh, specific example, he deeded the property to me. But he was, the one on, uh, he was the one that was the mortgage person. So, I mean, in other words, he was the bank. So that's how an owner finance deal works. Now, how is that different from a subject two? Well, a subject two is kind of uh, crafty. Watch this. The, the seller is going to sign a deed over to you. So now you're the owner. But the loan doesn't change. The loan stays exactly the same. And what you do is you just send payments to the bank. Pretty creative, isn't it? Now, some people think, well, wait a minute, is the bank going to accept your payments? Yes. They don't care where the money comes from, so long as it comes in. So you're probably thinking, well, geez, well, who's, who's willing to do that? Who's willing to give their home to you, but then they, their name and their credit stays on the line? Well, let me give you a story. All right. So, this was the, uh, the owner of this property, a guy named Corey. He was a friend of somebody I knew. And uh, they said, you know, Phil, I hear that you've been getting into real estate. And by the way, real estate, a lot of it is um, you can generate business through referrals or talking to other people and let them know what you do. And so, I said, yeah, I'm in real estate. He said, well, I got this friend of mine, Corey, who needs to get rid of his house now. I said, okay, I'll go meet with him. So I go over to this property here, and uh, I'm talking to Corey, and this is what he tells me. He says, well, Phil, the property is worth about 105, and I owe about 100,000. He says, Phil, I've been trying to sell my property. I'm just getting stuck. Why is Corey having trouble selling his home? He owes about as much as it's worth. He can't even pay the commissions and the closing costs. When you sell a property, there's expenses. It's funny in real estate, when a deal closes, you wouldn't believe all the hands that come out asking for money. It's pretty funny. So he can't sell his home. Well, I, I, I brought this up to him. Oh, by the way, his total payment was 900. I, I asked him, I said, well, Corey, what if I took over your payments? I dealt with your 900 bucks a month. That way, because he was moving out. That way you can move out and move on with your life. 
He was like, oh, that'd be amazing. I said, yeah, now I can't pay off the whole 100 right now, but maybe in a couple of years I'll be able to do it. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll just be able to deal with your payment. And, uh, and Corey was happy to do it. Now, is every seller going to be happy to do that? No. No, this is a small fraction of the overall number of sellers out there. In fact, it's even, more, uh, it's even more reduced by the fact that typically we're dealing with people who want to sell their home that are not working with a real estate agent. When you drive out off campus and you see real estate signs, those are usually from people that are working with real estate agents. When someone's working with a real estate agent, rarely is that real estate agent going to want this to occur because then they won't get their commission. So this is a small fraction. Uh, our studies have shown about 5% of the total seller market fits into this category where they're kind of stuck and they need to get rid of their property fast. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, I also told Corey, I said, well, now look. So now if I'm going to take over your payments, I'm going to take on your responsibility, I'm going to need some, uh, I'm going to need to make sure that I've got complete control of this property. Uh, would you mind if I became the owner? And again, I shoot these people straight. You know, you got to share with exactly what's going on. And he said, well, I guess uh, that's what I got to do, Phil. That's fine. So he deeded the property to me. So now I'm the owner, but his name is on that loan. And my responsibility is what? Make his payments. Now, I wasn't moving into this property, so who was going to actually make these payments? The tenants. The tenants. That's right. So I, uh, I moved into tenant. Oh, this, this should be pretty interesting here. Um, I don't know how much y'all have talked about yet uh, as far as loans, but um, this loan was an FHA 30-year 6.25% fixed rate loan. Uh, let me... <laughs> Let me uh, impact that. FHA, Federal Housing Administration, that's a government-backed loan. Government-backed loans typically have lower interest rates. Uh, number two, it's a 30-year mortgage, which means it's got a lower monthly payment because you know, the payments have been stretched out. And then 6.25, when this property was purchased about 10 years ago, that was a good deal. Nowadays, I mean, 4 and 5% is a good deal. Um, but, you know, interest rates, by the way, you look at history, on real estate, they've gone up to as much as 18% in the early 80s. So 6.25 is kind of a slam dunk. Now, here are some hidden benefits of this whole thing. Number one, by the way, the tenant pays about 1000 a month. I still own that property, by the way. I own it for a long, long time. Um, every month, that tenant is paying a little bit of that mortgage down, isn't he? Because a part of that 900 bucks a month is kind of chipping down that, that mortgage, the overall 100000 which is nice. So that's building equity for, for me. Next, it's a low interest rate loan. You're also probably going to discover, um, as you investigate the world of getting a loan out there, that believe it or not, investors have to pay a higher interest rate than people who live in the home. People that live in a home are called owner occupants because they live there. And banks, I suppose, assume that you're more likely to pay your own home mortgage bill than you would if you had an investor property. So investors have to pay a higher interest rate. But you see what's so creative about this subject to transaction? You can get low interest rates even though you're an investor. Okay, so you've got a low interest rate loan and you have the other aspect of this which is property appreciation. What's appreciation? Price of the property goes up. Now what's happened the last seven years? depreciation. Most statistics are proving that we are at rock bottom right now. Now I am, um, I'm not a prognosticator, I'm not a, a, a market forecaster, but as I'll talk about a little later, there's a lot of indicators proving that now is the perfect time to buy a single family home, if you were going to do it in the next 20 years, and you could all do it. Now is a wonderful time because most properties in places like Florida are actually, it's cheaper it's cheaper to buy a property than it is for somebody to actually build it. Get the materials, get the contractors out there, buy the land and build the thing. And that's a really special time. Because real estate in general, and this is kind of a fascinating statistic and you'll see it in the book as well. Residential real estate over the past hundred years has not appreciated. On average, uh, a professor out of Yale uh, put this together from like 1900 to, I'm sorry, 1910 to like 2010. 
it actually just keeps pace with inflation. Now, certain pockets of residential real estate go up um, above that, uh, that, uh, that inflationary number. But that's kind of interesting. That means real estate doesn't really appreciate it. It just kind of stays with inflation. But in a situation like now, where real estate's gone way too far down, now there's a little, uh, there's a little gap and an opportunity. So in this particular case, I've benefited from all three of these. And I still own this property. So I have a tenant in there right now, paying the mortgage off, giving me a little bit of money e extra each month. It's not a lot of money. But then I'm building equity each and every month, year after year. Now, uh, with the property, um, when I bought this, property prices are about at the same mark as they were when I bought this thing. So it's not like I've appreciated much. But I haven't lost anything. And I'm looking better and better each and every month. That's how you build wealth. You build wealth by owning real estate. And this is how you can do it without having to go get a bank loan. How do you, how, how do you manage the, the property? Oh, great question. Property management. Property management, in my opinion, comes down to one thing. Tenant selection. You choose your tenants wisely. So I choose tenants. I love nurses. Anybody in the medical field, because they'll have a job tomorrow. They'll be able to pay me. Plus, nurses, if they ever fall behind, can, uh, can pick up a couple of extra shifts. And then what I do is I direct draft the payments right out of their bank account on the first. Comes out of their bank account. If, they, if, it, if, it, if it overdrafts, I hit them again on the next day, and then I try to hit their credit card. And if that happens, and I still don't got the money, I send it to my eviction attorney, and he takes care of it. And um, it doesn't matter which state you're in. If you have the right eviction attorney, they can be out in 30 days. I, I, I make it very militant. I, I'm not their buddy. I'm not their friend. This is business. And um, if they're not paying the mortgage, I got to pay the mortgage. And if I got to pay the mortgage, that's less money for my wife to go shopping with. And then I hear it. <laughs> I should say it's less money to build wealth, but less money to, to give to charitable causes. So here's the question I always get. Phil, why would anyone agree to leave their name on the loan and let you become the owner? I mean, why would Corey say, here, Phil, take my home. Oh, by the way, that's fine. My loan will stay on my credit for the next 10 years. You just pay it each month. He needed to get rid of his home. He was in a tight spot. Most people aren't in his situation. But we're not dealing with most people, are we? We're dealing with a select few people. They need to be motivated to get rid of their property. And this is our little tip in business. You may want to circle this in your ongoing notebook of life. You are not always your customer. Have you ever looked at a retail store before and gone, man, how, does any, how do they stay in business? Man, I've never seen anybody there. I'd never go there. I'd never buy anything there. They're overpriced. Da -da -da. You are not their customer. Businesses cater to certain customers. And if you're not in that little, that little box, you may never understand why that business is even alive. You, all of us in this room, college educated, we may, may never in our right minds let somebody just take our home and they, and they just make payments to the mortgage. But there's a lot of people that are in desperate situations and need to get out. And sometimes this works out really well. I'll give you an example. If somebody's uh, actually falling behind on payments and you can catch them up, now that would be a little bit of a down payment, right? Maybe a couple of thousand to catch up the back payments. You can actually help their credit, which it's better for you to catch up the payments than for them to sell their home. If they sell their home while they're behind, it actually hurts their credit more. So it actually can help them. There's going to be some people that say, Phil, I am not going to just turn my house over to you. Just because you're going to take over the payments, that's fine, that's dandy, but I'm not going to just give you my home. In that case, we go to a lease option. That's the third way. The lease option, the owner's still on the deed. The owner's still on the mortgage. The owner still owns the home. The difference is you get a lease and you get the option to buy. Raise your hand if you've signed a lease. OK, great. So you've been through that experience before with a landlord. Well, it's basically a lease, but then you also get an option to buy the property for maybe a couple of years or more. And that option to buy, what's nice about that is you're the only one who can buy it, but you don't have to buy it. OK? Let me give an example of a deal like that. So um, 
This was a for rent sign. So if you're driving around and you're looking for, a, uh, for your next rental for maybe next semester where you're going to live, uh, you may want to use this little technique here. So I, um, I saw this for rent sign and it was in front of this condo here and I, I gave the owner a call and uh, I said, how much are you asking for rent? And um, let me see what my numbers are. Hold on, I may have forgotten already. All right, yeah, he said, he said well, I need at least 800. Minimum, 800. I'd, I'd really like to do 850. Cow wasn't a good negotiator. He's already telling me it's a low bid, right? And uh, I said, oh, I said, I got you. What's the situation? He said, well, uh, just graduated from Vanderbilt Nursing, and I got a job in Atlanta. And I'd like to, uh, to get moved out as quickly as possible. And, um, and I'm having trouble selling the home right now. I've had it listed for a couple of months, and nobody's buying. That happens. You know, I mean, here's what his problem was. His problem was that his condo complex was being built. Uh, it was still being built at the time. What that means is he was competing with builders. And so if somebody came into that condo complex to buy a condo, that builder would just take him by the hand and say, oh, come on down here. We're going to get you some paint. We'll get you whatever carpet color you want. We'll get you a brand new building. And who do you think they're going to buy from? The one that's two years old that they can't change the paint and carpet color or the brand new home. You see? So he was competing against this builder. So he couldn't sell the property. So I asked him, same thing I, I asked Corey. I said, would, would it work for you if, I, you know, I can't buy this property for what, what you're asking right now and, and just pay the loan off, but what if I just took over the payments? So you could move to Atlanta. You could get to your new job and get moving. And then I could, you know, I'd, I'd deal with it from there. And then at some point in the future, I, I could sell it. Hopefully, you know, be in a couple of years, I have to wait for this builder to finish building. But then after that happens, you know, I can, I can get rid of it then. And he was all about it. So I sent the paperwork over to him. Well, his mom was a 20-year real estate agent in Atlanta. And she said, whoa, don't just turn that house over to this old boy. Sorry, I'm from Tennessee. These are some Tennessee phrases. Uh, he said, instead, do a lease with option. So that's what we did. So in other words, a lease with option is kind of a fallback plan if the seller won't do a subject two. And what happens is I, I put the deal, the deal together for six years, 800 bucks a month with the option to purchase it for 120. And so in this particular case, I moved somebody in, a tenant, and I gave the tenant the option to buy it. Well, for more than 120, it was more like 130. And so I sold it to the tenant a few years later. So that's the other way to do it. Now, this would be pretty simple for any of y'all in the room here to ask if you were looking to rent something around here. You could say, hey, I see you got this place for rent. Um, have you ever considered selling it? A lot of landlords consider selling their properties for all sorts of reasons. And so what you could do is you could do a lease, and then you just have the option to buy it. Now, you don't have to buy it, but you'd have the option to buy it. Now, in this scenario, I guess you're probably thinking, well, Phil, how am I going to buy it, you know, a couple of years from now? Well, yeah, you'd have to get a regular loan. That's kind of the, uh, that's why with lease options, we use that more for investing. That makes sense? Because with investing, we're going to have somebody else in there, and we're going to get them to buy it. And so the other nice thing about these is there's no real estate agents involved, so we save on the commissions. So even if the deal doesn't have a lot of room, we can still make a couple of bucks. And a um, little tidbit on this particular deal, this was kind of a... Uh, because uh, Dr. Harris had asked me to give you some of the, uh, the negatives as well as the positives. This guy had a loan that had an adjustable rate. And that became a problem when it started to go up. And all of a sudden, his 800 payment turned into 900. That ended up uh, where I basically broke even with the rent. So a little tidbit, if you're going to agree to start paying payments in the future for somebody, Make sure it's a fixed rate loan, because if it's variable, you may wake up one, one Thursday morning and realize that you're no longer making any money on your deal. That's no fun. All right, so which one of these versions is better? Well, really, owner financing is kind of your only option for properties that have no loans on them. So it's, it's kind of like having a couple of different arrows in your quiver. You can bring out one if it, if it, you know, if it suits best, or bring out another depending on the situation. 
Uh, the subject to is nice because you become the owner. There's a real problem with lease options. And that is that if you're not the owner, that person could get liens against them. And let me tell you a war story. Okay, this brings out some pain. So if I uh, get emotional here shortly, you'll understand why. I had done a lease option and I had this tenant buyer in the property and they were going to buy it. And I was going to make $45,000 cash. It was going to go into my bank account. I could almost see the money. I mean, I was already dancing. I mean, this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, guess what happened? Right before closing, the title company found out that the seller's wife had never paid her student loan debt. Student loan debt never goes away, y'all, unless you pay it. You can't file bankruptcy to get rid of it. It just, it's like glue. It just sticks to you. Well, apparently she didn't tell her husband when they got married that this had happened. In fact, they got married after I'd owned the property. But in the state of Tennessee, as soon as you get married to somebody, you both own the property. So she had $70,000 in student loan debt. Now, if I would have done a subject to, I would have owned the property and her student loan debt would not have mattered. But instead, I didn't own the property. In Tennessee, if you've got any judgments filed against you at the courthouse, those have to be paid before something is sold. $45,000 did not go into my bank account that day. In fact, it never did on that property. I had to give it back to them. That's the uh, thing about a lease option is you can give the property back to them because you're leasing it from them. Yeah, question. If you owe, if there's a lien on your property, and can you still sell your property and then they take all the money for the lien? Or yeah, well, if, they, if they take over the property, they take over your lien. Now it's their problem. Okay. Now, technically, it'll still be in your name, the lien, or, but, but if they ever want to sell that property, they got to deal with it. Yeah, because what will happen is the way the recorder's office works is um, when you record a deed, that doesn't necessarily disappear who the loans are. Because remember, they're separate documents. So yeah, those, whatever liens are there will stick around. And uh, I don't know that it works like that in, uh, in Florida, because I haven't dealt with it. Uh, but in Tennessee, the uh, bankruptcy and, and collections attorneys of Tennessee, they all got together one day and figured out how to make sure they can get paid more money with doing no work. It's called making it a law that you've got to pay all the loans off before you can sell real estate. They'll still attach it. <laughs> they do? They attach in Florida? Yeah, they won't, they won't disappear from a deed or anything. Right, yeah, they just they stay there. Yeah. If you had to go back to that situation, what would you have done? To I would have done the subject too, where I became the owner. I would have just said to him, I would have said, look, if I'm going to promise to make your payments every single month so you don't have to worry about that problem anymore, I'm going to have to be the owner. We're going to have to put this property, uh, you're going to have to deed the property to me. I don't want to do a lease option uh, because if I do a lease option, I, I, I have that sort of threat. Now, the other thing you could do, um, but you could record a second mortgage to protect your interest, but then you'd have to show that that actual money was transferred. So if you had an extra 30 grand in your bank account, you could say you lent the money to yourself, but if you don't have that money, you really can't do that. So really the best way to do it is just do a subject to, or a lease option is kind of your last case resort, but then you'd want to do a title search and make sure the person wasn't full of liens. Um, hey, kind of a funny little side note. If the owner said to you, they said, well, I, if you're going to become the owner, I, I still have to have some control here. There's one other thing you can do. Has anybody ever heard of a trust, a land trust? This is a really cool uh, tidbit. Florida is one of the best states in America for doing creative real estate. The exact opposite would be Washington. Washington's like Russia. It's like communists. Uh, whereas here, here's flexible. You can do all sorts of stuff. It's capitalist, right? We've lost a lot of money in Washington uh, for deals that didn't go through because they changed laws. So um, what happens is uh, in the state of Florida, you can, you can buy real estate and the name on the deed can be a trust. UCF trust. You can name anything you want to. Superman trust, whatever you want to name it. And then the trust then has these beneficiaries. But here's the beauty. Nobody knows who the real owners are. All they see is the name of the trust. They have no idea because the, there's no other documentation showing who the trust owners are. So you can have complete anonymity. Now guess when the legislation was passed in Florida for the land trust. You're in Orlando. What is one of the biggest things in Orlando? When, 
when Disney was buying up all that land, he didn't want anybody to know because if, if all the other owners of the, of, of the land saw he was buying the other stuff, they would go, ooh, my stuff's more valuable, and they'd charge him more. So before, the day before he bought his first property in Central Florida, the, um, the land trust uh, legislation was passed in the state of Florida. And um, Disney was a big part of it. So we can thank Walt Disney. All real estate investors in Florida can thank him. So um, that's a really creative strategy as far as making sure nobody knows uh, who the real owner is. And there's some real value in that at times. Uh, because if you build a portfolio of 200 homes, all it takes is one tenant to say, ooh, here's Mr. Rich Man. I'm going to sue him. So if every property is in a different name, it'd be really hard to search and figure out you know, all your properties. And also what that could do is uh, if somebody, like in that particular situation, if we moved it into a trust, I could still let that guy, um, his name was Orsinta, Orsinta say. How could you, how could you forget losing $45,000, right? I could have had Orsinta be the, be the beneficiary of that trust, but that would have still worked because then I wouldn't have had to deal with, the, uh, with the, um, the student loans. The problem is, is when you leave it in their name long term, you could, you could potentially not be able to sell it down the line. Are you all having a good time? Is this fun? Okay. And again, the lease option is, is kind of a fallback plan. All right, so what are some raw drawbacks? All right, in the real world, everything's not rosy, right? First thing is you got to have a motivated person. You know, I see it so often where someone, you know, hears about these strategies and they go out there and they try it. And they're like, well, it didn't work. Well, it didn't work because you were talking to somebody who wasn't interested. This may be a bad analogy, but it'd be kind of like a guy who is just in love with a girl who just absolutely was not at all interested. You know, and they go to class and, you know, she starts kind of going a different route, doesn't really want to see this guy. And he's like, man, I haven't seen her in a while. Yet the point is, is they're not interested. And that's the same thing here. You're not looking for the majority of sellers out here that would look at this and go, I'm not going to just let you take my home, or I'm not going to be the bank. If I, if I own my home outright for $100,000, I want hundred grand cash in my, in my hand when I sell it. No, we're looking for that group of people that is desperate. Um, there's a lot of ways to find those people. Um, you heard some stories about just like examples here where I just like called up on a sign and whatnot. That can sometimes be the most uh, productive at times if you've got some time on your hands, a little bit of gas and a vehicle. Because if you can just drive around and see some for rent and for sale signs, that works. For sale by owner signs, excuse me. Um, but then once you get all uh, fancy, um, like the investors that, uh, that we work with, then you start running advertisements and all sorts of stuff. But you can do this simply by looking for some signs, going on Craigslist. There's a lot of junk on Craigslist, but every so often you'll find a gym. The next thing is you have to have the right paperwork. And that's really where an attorney comes in. You really want to use a real estate attorney. And if you've been to the local real estate club uh, around here, they have attorneys that will help you with this. You just tell them what you want to do. Say, I want to do a subject too. Can you send me a contract that will do that here in the state of Florida so I don't get in any trouble? Some of these properties may need a little bit of fix up. But would that be okay if you didn't have to go get a loan, you could become a homeowner? If you had to do a little bit of paint and carpet, would that be okay? So some of these, and you got to, this becomes all clear when you're actually out there doing it. Because think about it. Some people are going to want to sell their home and they're not going to deal with a real estate agent. Y'all seen HGTV. You know, when the real estate agent walks in, they're like, oh, yeah, you're going to need to change this, knock out that wall. Yeah, we, oh, new kitchen, definitely. Well, sellers don't want to hear that. I mean, when they're tired and they're stressed out and the kids are screaming and they want to sell their home so they can move on with life, and they get a real estate agent walking in there with the high heels and telling them all about what needs to be done, sometimes they get turned off. And if you can just walk up and say, oh, now leave the house a mess, no worries. The dirtier the better. I'll be over there in a minute. Sometimes they're just like, oh. And they just want to sign, they want to get rid of the property, and they don't want to deal with the hassles. That's why sometimes these creative deals, a little bit of cosmetic, you know, cosmetic is going to be, you know, paint, uh, simple stuff. I'm not talking about major things like plumbing or anything. If you have problems like that, you know, then you have to consider, do you have the money to pay a contractor to go fix those things? And then all of a sudden there's money out of pocket. Here's an important drawback. You're usually not going to get as low of a price as if you paid all cash or you had a loan. Why is that? Because you're paying for the convenience of paying off their 
Yeah, because you're paying for the convenience of not getting a loan. See, if you've got a bunch of cash in your hand, you usually can buy things for cheaper, can't you? If you're on the car lot or you're, you know, you're buying a, a, an appliance, TV or whatnot, in fact, that's a good way to go buy a TV at Best Buy uh, and other places. You can negotiate those things. Just take out the $100 bills and just start kind of fingering them. Say, I'm looking for a TV today, sir. Can you help me? So if you got cash, you can negotiate lower prices. So you're not necessarily going to get the lowest price. But is that always bad? No. Sometimes it's okay to pay full price so long as you didn't have to go get a loan. And it may require a down payment. There are going to be times where the seller says, okay, I'll let you take over my property, but I'm going to need at least five grand for move out expenses. And uh, I've got a good example of that. We had a, 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 somebody I teach out in uh, South Dakota, of all places. It was a duplex, and it was rented on both sides for 900 so 1800 altogether. And uh, is there a marker? Josh? Oh, okay, don't worry about it. So uh, 1800 a month was coming in, and this owner owed 100000 and the total payment was like eh, somewhere around 1100 Bringing in 1800 a month and all he has to pay 1100 That's good money, isn't it? 700 bucks a month. Just whether you wake up or not, it shows up. 700 bucks. Well, that owner needed 10 grand, some gambling debt or something. I guess there's some casinos out uh, South Dakota because of all the uh, American Indians. So gambling debt problem needs to get 10 Gs fast. And a student had, some, uh, had a little bit of money in a, in, a, in a retirement account, paid 10 grand to the person, and the person gave him the deed. And so now my student's got a property that's bringing in 700 bucks a month and had to put up 10 grand. You see how that worked? So now there's a little bit of an enticement to get them to go ahead and uh, turn over the property. But my student's pumped, 700 bucks a month. Uh, these were long-term tenants. It's, so far, the last year, it's gone perfectly well. They're going to get their 10000 back in a couple of years, right? And then it's all gravy. And then, here's the best part. That property was worth one sixty, and they only owe one hundred. That looks good on the balance sheet, too. Extra sixty grand. Looks good. But with much comes much responsibility. I've given you kind of the proverbial keys to the kingdom here, y'all. You could use this for evil, or you could use it for good, okay? Let me give you an example of using these techniques for evil. There was a fella, I guess is the nicest way to say it, in Nashville. And here's what he did. He would go up to sellers of properties. He would target the people that had bought homes in new subdivisions who were trying to sell, him, to sell their property. Because remember what we talked about? If you're competing with the builder, it's a lot harder to get rid of your property. And he'd go up to him and he'd say, oh, I'll take over your payments. Yeah, it'll all be good. You just move out, everything will be fine. And then he wouldn't start making the payments. Instead, he'd move a tenant in there and just collect the rent, just the rent, each month until the house went to foreclosure. Now, the thing is, believe it or not, houses can take a year or more to go to foreclosure, a year and a half, two years. So this guy was just collecting rent and letting people's uh, credit be destroyed. Now, uh, he did end up going to jail point is, you can use it for evil, and that's not what this is about. With much knowledge comes much responsibility. So if you are going to do these creative deals, you need to make sure you follow through those commitments. So if that means that you're going to take over someone else's house and you're going to pay their mortgage payment, you better pay it. Or don't jump into it. Or, or just don't get in the business. But you don't want to be in a situation where you did what that guy did. Question? In a situation like that where he doesn't pay, he gets, uh, no. The only reason why he got legally penalized had to do with the fact that he, uh, he was literally lying and he had a paperwork that said he was going to pay. So if he wouldn't have done that, he actually, from a legal standpoint, he would have never got any legal trouble. He just would have made a lot of people mad and just been a jerk. Yeah, so technically he just taken the rent and just moved away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, you can, he just, and this is another thing about crooks you'll learn is they eventually get caught because they're just not smart enough. They always leave a couple of holes, and that's what he did. But it's technically possible that you could, you know, if you didn't use any other paperwork but just had them sign the deed over, there'd be no paperwork to prove that you promised to pay. 
You could do that. What about people who own the house still with the mortgage? Well, the people who have the mortgage, their credit's getting destroyed. Yeah, their credit's trying to do no way to say, hey, I have a... Right. He, they can't go back to the credit bureaus. Good question. You can't go back to the credit bureaus and go, look, you're not going to believe this. This slick talking short guy from uh, New Smyrna came rolling in, told me some good ideas. And uh, yeah, I'm in a bit of hot water. Is there any way we could reverse life? No, they won't do it. They'll just, it'll be destroyed. And so uh, you can get your credit repaired. Um, that's a whole nother industry. So that helps people in certain cases. But yeah, it's one of those things, once it happens, it, it, there's no really way to erase it. But after seven years, it usually, the credit usually uh, changes. Question? I, I've got a comment. Um, there actually are some people today with, who have houses. Let's say you reverse the numbers like they owe 400, but it's worth 200. Where they'll, sometimes they'll, an investor, or I don't know if you feel like they're paying the person some money. They're saying, look, we're not going to make the payment any better than you are, because they're not making the payment at all. We are going to attempt to rent it. Either give some money back to that seller, or we'll try to fight the foreclosure. So kind of doing the same thing, but they're fully disclosed. I mean, it's yeah. actually, yeah, and that's, they're, they're trying to get the, the mortgage, it's a whole other thing, trying to get the mortgage eliminated or somehow short sold, but uh, there's a, people are even buying deeds at um, the, the HOA foreclosures, I've seen. Yeah, that. yeah, now that's a whole nother, uh, yeah, that, that's a fun little story. I may tell you if we got a little yeah. more time about the HOA game. Uh, but um, <laughs> what, what he was also mentioning is the idea that let's say somebody has not made a mortgage payment in a year. They've been living for free for a year. They're worried it's going to go to foreclosure. They move out. Now that property's sitting vacant. Grass is growing tall. What some people are doing, what he was saying, is they'll go in, that, they'll, they'll contact that owner. They'll find out the address. They'll do like a skip trace or hire a private investigator. Find who that person is. Talk to them and say, look, your house is vacant. Would you mind if I moved a tenant in there on like a two, three-month lease kind of thing and just collected a little bit of quick money, and then I'll give you half? And they're like, yeah, and you can do that. Now, remember, the person's credit's already destroyed, so they don't really care if they continue to not make payments. And it actually works pretty well. Um, but again, there's uh, the issue, of course, is you have to find a tenant who wants to move all their furniture in there for a month or two, because you can't keep that lease going very long. Actually, do you have market, do you have market lease with them? The new law in Florida says the bank has to honor it after foreclosure. Yeah, that's right. I've heard that as well, uh, that the bank has to honor it. Um, if you know, market, if it's a market rate lease. Yeah, if it's right, you know, in, uh, in West Palm and in other parts of this, uh, the state as well, there's lots of foreclosures that are, that are uh, being inhabited by homeless people. And the banks are happy to have it because they'd rather have somebody in there rather than nobody. So there is some of that. That's, that's definitely going in a fun direction, but I, uh, I could talk about that for a, a long, long time, about all these different angles you can take in the foreclosure game. And it's, it's all because there's so many foreclosures the bank can't get it all taken care of. Plus, Florida is a judicial state. They have to go in front of a judge. And that just takes forever. You've seen government employees. They show up at 9, they end at 2, take a big lunch. They can't get through all those foreclosures. Amen, brother. That's right. Okay, so what are some common pitfalls? The first is trying to convince an ordinary seller to do a creative deal. We're not selling people here. You're looking for people that are already motivated. If you try to convince somebody to do something like this, even if you're a great salesperson and you convince them at the point at which they sign a contract with you, they can still change their mind. You know, this is not like selling stereos out of the back of a pickup, you know, in the Walmart parking lot. And once the exchange is made, no refunds, no returns, it's over. Now, this is long term. You sign a contract, it could be at least 30 days before they do something. And think about this. You know, if it's not a good deal for them and they think that you're going to take advantage of them, they're going to call their mom or their sister or their brother and they're going to say, is this a good deal? And they're going to go, no, it's a terrible idea. So in other words, you have to make sure you're working with people that already want to do this so you're not convincing them of anything. We've worked with people that have a great sales background and they actually run into problems because they do such a good job of selling people on these things that the people end up, uh, you know, going back and saying, I don't want to do this anymore. So work with people who want to do this. That way when they're at a, a cocktail party, they say, oh yeah, I had to get rid of my house. I just let somebody just take over the payments. You did? Really? Oh, I had no other option. I had to. Now the person will support their decision. And that's what you need. You need people that want to support their own decisions. Don't take over variable interest rate loans subject to, I already told you that. Because what happens? The payment could go up. Could the payment go down? Sure. But it usually doesn't. 
doing a bad creative financing deal just because you can. You're going to be able to take over some people's properties, but you really shouldn't. Just because they'll let you do it doesn't mean it's a good idea. Either A, it's got to be a property you're going to live in, so you'll make the payments, or B, it's a property that at least is going to make some money. You know, if you're not going to at least make a couple hundred bucks a month or have some equity in the deal, you might as well pass on it. Just because it's cool and it's, it's, it's attainable doesn't mean it's a good idea. Does that make sense? And then giving up before you succeed. That's probably so cliche, you probably heard it a hundred million times. I gotta tell you, in life, if you never give up, it's amazing what you can accomplish. I was living out of my truck in Nashville, Tennessee. I was, I was homeless. And 10 years later, I'm a public speaker, an author, and I teach people how to invest in real estate all across the country, the Caribbean, and, and, and Canada. So I never gave up. Now, this doesn't just relate to real estate, but whatever you wanna do, Stick with it. Most people don't. But when you do, it's amazing what you can accomplish in life. All right, so hopefully you've been listening. We're going to challenge those brains of yours. All right, so here we go. I'm going to give you the, uh, the details. This is a for rent sign that you saw when you were driving around. You give it a call. Person's asking $1,000 a month. The owners are moving. That's why they're selling. Now they've been trying to sell it for like 125, but they've had no offers. They're blaming a bad economy and this, that, and the other. Now they owe about 110,000. And the issue is when they move, they've got another rent payment coming up in Tampa where they're moving to, and they simply can't make double house payments. What kind of deal is this? It could be a subject too. Why? Yeah. They can't make double house payments. They're going to have to do something. Either they're going to stop making payments on this house when they move, or they ain't moving. And when people have a job transfer, sometimes they've got to move. There is no option. Now, what if they don't agree to a subject two? You can do that lease option. And then you can check the title to make sure there's no liens. And then uh, you could actually file a second mortgage if you had some cash in the bank to prove it was a real second mortgage. Question. How do you start checking the owner's credit history? Yeah, well, what you would do is you'd actually check the title because in that case, the, her debt was against the title to the property, which is at the recorder's office. Um, there are some programs that you can pay for that'll do a, like, a, like a search of all of the liens against a property. Uh, the, the courthouse also, some courthouses actually have it all online. You could search it for free or you could actually just go down there. Um, and you could, you could ask the person there, hey, could you pull up any liens against this property? Uh, and then there's this thing called a title search, which a closing company or a title company does, and they officially look up the title. So the other way you could do it is pay 100 bucks to a title searcher and they would go do it. And there's a million title companies in the city. You could just search any one and they'd do it for you. Good question. So their total payment was $9.75. And so you could do a subject two. Now, what if this property only rented for $900? Right, you're losing money. Is that a good idea? I know that sounds like such a simple question. It's like no brainer. I'm telling you, I've met people, they're like, oh, my first subject two and I only lose 100 bucks a month. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Now, in this particular case, if it was, say, a three-bedroom, two-bath, how could you uh, maybe rent it for more money? Get us to some students. Now, the great thing about y'all is you know this campus, or at least this part of campus, so you know where people are walking in and out. You know where to stick some billboards with little, you know, little tear-offs. You know how to potentially send out messages. I don't know if they allow, like, emailing between groups, but you know how to access the student body here better than a typical landlord who's never been to school here. Does that make sense? So you have better access to students to be able to rent to. I got a friend of mine um, up in Pennsylvania that this is all he ever did was student housing. He's selling his whole portfolio for like 4.5 million. I was talking to him the other day. About 10 years out of school. Not even bad. Four and a half large. Okay, so here's challenge number two.
for sale by owner sign. You give it a call, person's asking $100,000, they've inherited the property, they got no loans on it. But it may need some work because they inherited it, it's been vacant for a little while, they, they haven't dealt with the property, it was their mother who lived there and she hadn't really kept it up all that well doesn't want to deal with a real estate agent, doesn't want some agent to walk in that property and tell them how much work needs to be done to it. Owner lives in Tampa. What kind of deal is this? Owner financing. That's right. Now, sometimes when you deal with somebody who's inherited a property, they want the cash now. So you can do it one of two ways. You could offer them, say, hey, I'll give you 50 today, or I'll give you 100 over time. What would you rather have? See what I'm saying? Some people may want the 50 today, and if that's the case, you can get it under contract and it's called wholesaling or flipping. You could flip it to another investor for 60 and make 10 grand real quick. But if they, if, uh, so if you give them an option, the nice thing is your, your owner financing deal looks a little better. Now my first deal, that one with Marion, that was just so lucky. That guy knew about owner financing. I didn't know anything about it. And it worked out okay because I sold it a few years later and I bought it when the real estate market was going up. So even though he thinks he overcharged me and thought he was a genius, I actually made out okay on that deal. But uh, with, with these owner finance deals, uh, you also want to make sure your payments are low. This is really cool. You could just set the payment however much you wanted. You don't have to have a standard interest rate. You could say, look, I'll pay you 100 grand over time, 700 bucks a month. How's that? They say, okay, and literally it's 700 a month until you pay off 100 grand. No interest, interest-free loan. We do it all the time. It works. If you're, if you're working with somebody who just wants to get out of a property, another thing to consider, the reason why they do this, tax implications. That Marion guy, the reason why he sold it to me at, uh, on owner finance was because he was a builder and he had just closed out a huge subdivision. He said he built over 20,000 homes in his life. This guy was a home builder. Had the jet, had the con, I mean, guy was loaded. And he didn't want to get hit with a big fat tax that year based on his tax bracket and what was going on. So he would rather sell it to me over time. He didn't have to pay all the tax all at once. Kind of interesting, right? So sometimes the owner finance deal is what the seller wants to do anyways. Hot dog. So you get to be a homeowner. You didn't have to get a loan. How do you make that legally binding? Uh, what you do is you have an attorney create a mortgage. Just have, the, have an attorney do it. Just say, hey, here's the deal. And you just, you just tell them the terms. Say, look, here's what I worked out. This guy's going to be the bank. I'm going to pay him 700 bucks a month until I pay off 100000 Set up the paperwork. Let's close this. Or a title company can do it, too. Uh, and they'll, they'll write it up. That's the good news about this. You can get somebody else to do the actual paperwork. So what happens... Uh Yep. So if they agree to 50 now and looking for an investor, how long do they are willing to wait? How long are they willing to wait? That's a good question. Well, I tell you what you do. You stretch it out as long as you can, right? You say, look, it's going to take me at least 90 days. Boy, it's going to take some time. And sometimes they're okay with that. Now, sometimes they're not and they give you only like 30 days. And then you just get on it. You hustle. I'll tell you one of the best tips about how to find an investor is get you a get you one of those, have you seen those old white Coroplast signs? And get a big old like Magnum 44 marker, like the go on the space shuttle kind of markers, and just put, you know, for sale, 100K house for 50K and a phone number. The phone will ring off the hook and off the hook. Now don't put out too many of those signs. <sighs> Let me tell you what I did one time. I, uh, I had a bunch of signs out there. And uh, I kept getting a phone call. Take down these signs, man! You know, it's Tennessee. I mean, it's just, it's like, you know, that, that show about the, the guys that have those, uh, those uh, distilleries where they're making the moonshine? Yeah, that's Tennessee. Take these things down, man. So I, I was like, I hadn't found a buyer yet. And I'm like, man, I can't take these things down. Now, if it was like a cop or something, I'd go take them down. It's just some normal citizen. And, uh, he called one night and he said, if I don't see these things gone by tomorrow, I'm going to rip them all up, I'm going to turn them around, 
I'm going to write free pit bull puppies in a phone number. I'm going to stick them in the ghetto. I couldn't believe how creative it was. I was like, who's going to do that? He did it. 200 phone calls a day. I had to get rid of the phone number. I don't know where he put all the signs. The phone just kept going off the hook. <laughs> if you want to ruin someone's cell phone number, get that, that'll, that'll work for you. Okay, that was, that was a bonus. I'm not going to charge you for that one. All right. Dr. Harris, if I'm stretching into a wrong direction, you let me know. You reel me back in, <laughs> sir. For sale by owner sign, you see it, and it's, you see this home. It's a nicer home. They're asking $150 for it. They owe $130 on it. They're buying a new built home. So some home builder just wooed them into a beautiful new home. New subdivision where, you know, they got the, the pretty entrance and they've got the water coming out of the lake. And they need to sell the property so they can pay off the mortgage so they can free it up their credit so they can buy the new home. What kind of deal is this? Yeah, it's none of the ones I've talked about, is it? These people need to pay off their mortgage to get rid of their home so they can buy the new one. You're going to run into this out there. And you can't do a creative finance deal. Now, you could try to, uh, you could try to like flip it. Uh, if they owe 130 you could try to do that. We call it a retail wholesale. We talk about it in my book. But sometimes that can be a little rough because there's not much room left in the deal. When you have to flip a property and there's real estate agents involved and closing costs, that stuff really adds up. So yeah, this is, this is not a creative finance deal. So this is kind of a trick here. This is an example of where it doesn't work. Even if the person is as motivated as all get out, if they're begging you, they're on their knees, take my home, it doesn't work because they need to, get, they need to pay off their current mortgage so they can buy the new one. Make sense? All right, cool. Let's, I figured I'd leave it open for some more questions. Anything coming to mind on what I've talked about here that, yeah, go ahead. I was wondering if you just ever had a problem with the bank not wanting you to pick up and like trying to yeah. use the acceleration clause and, and maybe put those in the home instead of letting you pick it over. Yeah, what he's talking about is in a lot of mortgages, they write in there a sentence that basically says, if you change the deed, we have the right to foreclose. It's called the due on sale clause. And when you're doing a subject two where you get the deed, the deed does just change, you do trigger that clause. So he's asking, do we ever have any problems with that? Well, um, I've never heard of it, seen it. I've never uh, been a part of it. Um, it's, it's a lot more rare than seeing Bigfoot. Banks are happy to get their money. Yeah, the bank's just happy to get their money. Is it possible that a bank could look at the title and go, oh, you changed the deed, up, oh, we're going to foreclose? That's true. That could happen. We've never seen it happen in, uh, in 10 years and tens of thousands of properties. It is possible. And where we think it's most possible would be if you didn't pay the mortgage. If you didn't pay it, they'd eventually look at the title when they're going to the foreclosure process and they'd go, wait a minute, the borrower is not the same name as the owner. Oh, they changed the deed. Let's foreclose. But that would be because you hadn't paid them for eight months or, or longer. But yeah, so we haven't, uh, we haven't had that to be a problem. Um, and then here's the thing to think about there. If that ever was to happen, you know, just your luck. <laughs> you get struck by lightning, right? Just your luck, that happens to you. Well, you could always just sell the property at that point and just try to get rid of it because you'd get rid of it before they'd ever do their, their foreclosure. But yeah, if they're getting their payments, they're as happy as can be. Um, in fact, I mean, literally, as far as paying these banks, even though your name's not on the loan, I mean, you literally can set up direct draft. You could, they'll take the money however way they can get it. So yeah, you can definitely do it that way. Good question. All of us great questions. Go ahead. People don't care that they're basically kind of like renting you their house and you're turning around and like renting it to someone else? Uh, great question. They would if they were not motivated to get rid of their property. Oh, they'd have a real problem with that. But if they're desperate, they're moving away, they got to get rid of something, they get to the point where they just don't care. And it's, it's an interesting situation because you may never be through it in your entire life. You may never go through that situation. But once you meet just one of these people who tells you, Phil, just take my home. I don't care. Just take it. I'm so tired of it. Maybe it's a divorce. That's an interesting situation. Because in a divorce, typically one party is the one on the loan. And so what happens is 
that party is the one that's most freaked out about not being able to make their payments. And sometimes they're just like, look, I'm going through a divorce. I don't want to deal with this. I hate this home. Or you're dealing with an absolute crazy person. Funny story. So um, the nicest part of Tennessee is a, is a place called Brentwood. I, is, what are the nicer parts of Orlando? What, Windermere, those kind of areas? Okay, so I want you to picture like the nicest part of Orlando. And a buddy of mine told me the story because he owns the home right now. And he was, he was thumbing through the newspaper. This was, this was uh, in the year 1999. He's thumbing through the newspaper. He sees an ad where somebody's selling the property for like a third of what they should be selling it for. I mean, super, super cheap. And he's like, that's strange. He calls the guy up. The guy goes, yeah, no, 230 grand. That's what I'm offering. And the, my friend was like, isn't it worth like 700,000? Or is this house like a, you know, like a, a crater? What's going on? The guy goes, no. Nah. House is in great shape, wonderful shape. Guy's like, well, I, are you hiding something? Guy says, no. This, the guy uh, that owned the property, who was getting rid of it, was worried that in the year 2000, the world was going to blow up. <laughs> this guy invented the noodle, the noodle that you see in those pools. He was a multi, multi-millionaire. He didn't really need the money. He thought the world was going to end. So he sold this thing for two thirty. dollars It was worth $700,000. My buddy buys it, and he can't believe it. The guy helped him move in. You know, anything I can do for you, Dr. Campbell? You've done enough, sir. You've done enough. Well, you know, the end of the world didn't happen. Apparently, the guy who... Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is definitely not funny. Uh, uh, his wife left him. Uh, it took, took the kids with her. Uh, he went bankrupt. And so I guess to him the world did end. But uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. But yeah, I mean, do people just do nut stuff? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we got a new opportunity. Thank you, sir. Yeah. December 21st. Go look. Maybe you just run a couple ads in Craigslist. I'll buy your home before the world ends. <laughs> That's exactly what his point was. Oh, oh, because his plan was, he, okay, he's, that's a very astute, uh, right. Well, he was thinking, kind of like Mad Max, the uh, Thunderdome, he was thinking he'd be like in a, he bought a camper, like a, so he, and he went out into the woods, he went out to the high mountains. I mean, I was thinking, you know, like, on, you know, I don't know if there's some shows about it, where basically the whole world has ended, but a couple of people are left, you know? And he was thinking he was going to be the person to keep the, uh, keep the population going, which, you know, it's kind of scary he, pro he procreated, right? <laughs> Our gene pool, Dead Um Yes, question. What's the most effective way to get tenants into their property so you're not having an empty state? Oh, that's a great question. I am going to argue the best way to get tenants is uh, not only to do Craigslist and whatnot, to put out some signs as well. And then if you're, if you're doing student housing, get the word out. Get the, get the word out in any way you can. I mean, just do an all-out attack. Tell people you know. Uh, I like to put signs out in front of uh, hospitals because they all got jobs at a hospital. I mean, the hospital is just, a, you know, just surrounded by my signs. I was wondering the case with the, um, maybe we just didn't know that, how they got attached to the property. It's a, it's a state of Tennessee. A bunch of collection attorneys are so much smarter about creating laws, and they didn't want to go hire a bunch of paralegals to do their work for them, so they made it a state law that any time uh, anytime a judgment against a property uh, was recorded, that it had to get paid, um, even if it wasn't against the property, it was just recorded in that county to have to get paid off. That's what happens when, uh, when you let the attorneys write all the laws. If there's any attorneys in the room, I apologize, but it's true. Yeah, what I like to do is I like to, what I let, uh, you always let one person in the house handle utilities. And of course, he hates his two friends after a couple months because they're not paying him. But 
Uh, it, it always happens. But uh, yeah, so what I like to do also is every single parent's on the lease. They're all on the lease. I mean, so the signature on that lease is just, you know, you got all the parents, you got the, uh, and you got the, the, the actual students. So do the parents pay the hours of yeah. water? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. If you have two, three different parents that they come at the same time. Oh, well, I like to do it at the same time. Yeah, I don't know. How, I mean, you'd have to have separate entrances or something. Because I don't know how many people want to just go live with two random folks. I mean, maybe, maybe when you're a freshman and you get thrown in a dorm. But, you know, by sophomore, you've already negotiated who you're living with next year. Are we about wrapped up? Yep, we are pretty much out of time. We're out of time. All right. This is the perfect time, y'all. There's a lot of big players in the world right now buying single-family homes for the first time in history.